Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. He is now tonight, we can tell you, formally nominated. That was within the last hour. Selecting a running mate is a major decision in any campaign. That's always true and always a big deal. But this one today comes amidst the many other significant developments right now that we're covering and that, frankly, we're all living through as a, con as a country. This whirlwind of activity includes a lot of things you probably know about. It ranges from the horrific attempted assassination of the former president at the Pennsylvania rally, where that now deceased shooter was able to fire at former President Trump's head, grazing his right ear before snipers killed the shooter. And a firefighter attending that rally also tragically killed. This was a harrowing attack that echoes across our nation and the world. I am showing you just some of the headlines here. And it's also driving very important questions about what is a clear security lapse. And as a nation, we care about that because that would affect the Secret Service's competence and the confidence we have in it to protect all of the people under Secret Service protection. That would include, of course, the current president, the presidential nominees, and others. This convention, meanwhile, begins with official business today. The state delegation roll call vote, which does make Donald Trump the official Republican presidential nominee. If you recall all the conversation last couple weeks about when the Democratic nomination becomes official because of the questions about the president after the debate, well, here's an example in real life today. You're looking at that raucous, patriotic environment, the roll call vote. He is the nominee. And as Trump readies to return through the convention this week, he also got a huge win in court against Jack Smith today in the documents prosecution. A judge tossing that entire case, a Trump-appointed judge. The Justice Department making news late tonight as I was just getting ready to come on air that they will appeal that ruling, and we have more on that important case later tonight. As for Senator J.D. Vance, since jumping into Senate politics about two years ago, he has branded himself a Trump loyalist. So recent Vance is Trump on policy and style. He auditioned as a fighter, traveled to attend Trump's criminal trial, launched political attacks that go really beyond even what Trump himself would sometimes say. And he has a conservative voting record for the brief time he's been in the Senate. That, as I tell you, as a factual matter, is recent Vance. But as a rookie senator, he has far less of a record or experience than most people on the national ticket. He's been a senator for two years at 39 years old. He is one of the youngest running mates. And this is a time where, again, we say this carefully, judiciously and respectfully, but this is a time where the death of a potential or current president has been discussed, frankly, about both presidential nominees. So if Senator Vance assumed the presidency, say in the short term, in the next year or two, he would be one of both the least experienced and youngest presidents ever. Quite a combination. Now Vance has cleared those hurdles with Trump, clearly, who touted his Yale pedigree and his service as a Marine. Now Trump is not necessarily known for reading. He talks more about other medium than, say, long form books, but today, Former President Trump mentioned Vance's book, Hillbill Eulogy. Hillbill Eulogy. And what is striking is that since that writing, Vance has used basically his writing, political commentary, and ultimately the platform of that book as a way of arguing for a separation from what he dubbed essentially a kind of honest or old school conservatism as distinct from emerging Trumpism. Before Donald Trump won in 2016, Vance, announced today as Donald Trump's running mate, called Donald Trump noxious, reprehensible, and a, quote, idiot. He likened Trump's ability to hook the needy and the gullible as a use of kind of, quote, cultural heroin, something our colleague Nicole Wallace just mentioned. That is some of the past criticism. Vance, now promoted by following a current recent Republican tradition when it comes to dealing with Donald Trump. If you can't beat him, join him. Now, joining us first from the RNC reporting is Vaughn Hilliard. Uh, Vaughn, this is truly breaking news. We've seen uh, now Senator Vance on the floor there where you are. He was there recently. What is the reception? What are you seeing in your reporting and the, re the reception of the delegates? Because this is new information. They'd heard Vance was on the short list. Now he's the running mate. Right. I think, you know, in conversation with a few of the delegates that this is being well received, because let's be very clear, J.D. Vance over the last several years 
has been somebody that is, I, I think, been a not only ardent, loyal supporter of Donald Trump, but also an articulate messenger for what a second Trump administration could look like and what this America first ideology looks like in the vision of Donald Trump and better shaped by some people like him and Josh Hawley. And J.D. Vance, he was elected just in 2022. He's only been in the U.S. Senate for 18 months. But the folks here, of course, they know him from the Hillbilly Elegy story. And there is sort of a, a national recognition of who he is largely off of that. There is a connection that is based off of that identity. And so for Donald Trump picking him and his, as his running mate is notable here. We are in the middle of what is essentially the convention dinner break here. Everybody is, should be convening the more than 2,000 delegates about a half hour from now. You're going to see the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Glenn Youngkin, Senator Tim Scott speaking here on this Monday night, the first night of primetime. And of course, you saw J.D. Vance walk out here to cheers. And this was a, a, a moment where, let's be very clear here, Ari, I would say that there was not a clear-cut favorite to be Donald Trump's running mate. Of course, there may have been nobody more loyal to him than Mike Pence for a little more than four years until January 6, 2021. But when you're looking at the folks who he was considering, a good number of them had either said negative things about Donald Trump in the past, or they were perhaps not palatable to a larger part of the electorate, I say a Marjorie Taylor Greene or a Matt Gates, And that is what ultimately, uh, you know, despite the eight year history between these two men led to Donald Trump selecting J.D. Vance as the running mate, uh, vice presidential candidate with these 113 days left. Yeah, and Vaughn, when you look at what I mentioned before, we are living through uh, this absolute horrific, tragic attack, this attempted assassination of a former president and current, uh, now today, presidential nominee officially of the Republican Party. Um, that is a huge and significant thing that hangs over all of this. From a governing perspective, right. as we all understand, that's why the running mate, potentially if elected the vice president, plays a significant role. Um, you couldn't really script uh, a more dramatic, uh, albeit tragic, on-ramp. Uh, for Vance, having everyone held their breath to see whether any of those shots aimed at uh, uh, the nominee's head uh, connected. He lived through it, and that is hanging over the convention as you'll be covering for us. So can you walk us through what that feels like today and the relative, not only inexperience we mentioned, but also youth, a very right. young person backing up uh, a nominee who, like the current president, both of them, as we've mentioned, are, are elderly candidates. 39 years old. And in a lot of ways, Don Jr. has become especially close with J.D. Vance. And in these last months was at the forefront of pressing for him to be that vice presidential nominee here. Uh, uh, of course, watching the events unfold just about 48 hours ago now was a cloud that was hanging over this entire convention. I was talking to one delegate earlier who said that everybody here in this room has been to a Trump rally before. And they viewed what happened there as a situation they each could have found themselves in. Dave sure. McCormick, the U.S. Senate candidate for Pennsylvania. He was there in that front row at that rally. And, you know, for each of these elected officials, they usually have those prominent seats here. And so I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, you know, political violence and exactly what America uh, finds itself I I here in 2024, I, I think really came to a head here in July of 2024 here, right before this Republican convention. And I don't think that anybody is naive to the importance of a vice presidential pick and the extent to which somebody like a J.D. Vance, now having had at least a little bit of time, 18 months to build relationships in the U.S. Congress, uh, is a major factor as opposed to somebody like a Doug Burgum, who is serving the state of North Dakota as a governor. Mm -hmm. uh, Vaughn Hilliard on the convention floor there. We will be coming back to you uh, all night and all week. Uh, so thank you for your reporting. Stay safe and rested. Uh, I turn now to Bill Crystal, uh, who is a, a bit of a vice presidential expert himself, having uh, advised and served in the White House uh, for a, a Republican vice president. You also, as we know, uh, have been critical of Donald Trump in your current work. Welcome back. Uh, Bill, we've met uh, through our reporting many times. We meet here at a very serious time uh, after watching uh, the, the terrible attack uh, and the political violence this weekend and now onboarding into everything that's happening today. Uh, let's start with J.D. Vance. Uh, what does he bring to the ticket? What do you see as his strengths? Obviously, the, the nominee here who's in a good position, uh, Donald Trump, thinks this is a, a add, a strengthening of the ticket. Uh, and what do you see as his potential pitfalls? You know, Ari, it's really a radical pick. I, I'm not sure people have fully focused on this. 
J.D. Vance is uh, not just, I mean, he had other, Trump had other picks of people who were loyal to him, who had catered to him, who had bowed down to him, but who were not election deniers, who were not against aid to Ukraine. J.D. Vance's position on Ukraine is not that of Speaker Mike Johnson. It's not that of Tim Scott or Tom Cotton or a lot of other people who are pretty pro-Trump. Uh, Vance is, if anything, more anti-Ukraine than Trump has been for the last year. Vance is all totally on board with election denial and uh, with, you know, being pro-January 6th hostages. Uh, Vance has been gone further than the Heritage Project 2025 report in saying we not just we should have 50,000 political appointees, but we should fire every civil servant and have loyalty tests instead. So Vance is a radical pick. Whatever his views were eight years ago, one can talk about that and talk about his sincerity. But, you know, many authoritarian movements end up staffed by people who didn't start off as authoritarians and who were ambitious. But he is there, and he is a radical authoritarian, yeah. and Trump is picked him. Well, you're drawing people's attention to his positions, which also fit into the political uh, position of the, of the nominee, Donald Trump, and what he thinks he needs to do. Um, last cycles, he needed to shore up uh, other wings of the party. And Mike Pence, uh, while many people would say on certain policies, certainly on church and state and other issues, was a very strong conservative. On other issues you just mentioned, uh, the Constitution, uh, democracy as opposed to other attacks on it, uh, he represented something different. And it may have been through the need to build a coalition that Trump picked Pence. We all know how that ended. And here he's picked someone that you're saying uh, might, respect, might reflect uh, Trump's apparent confidence. We don't know what's going to happen in the election, but he apparently doesn't feel he needs to build from any other wing. You're saying um, that it's now double MAGA. Yeah, this is doubling down. It's a very confident pick, I suppose. He doesn't need some of those Nikki Haley type voters who kind of care about helping Ukraine, who don't want to see a to every civil servant politicized, who aren't really fond of the election denial. He doesn't seem to think he needs those voters. I think, from my point of view, this is a scary pick. It's, in my view, more dangerous for the country if he's vice president. But it's a risky pick for Trump because I do think it's not as politically, it's not obviously as politically smart as pick. Now we turn to our special report on the attempted assassination of former President Trump, an attack shocking the nation, sparking major questions, including how a single person apparently acting alone could get close enough to fire shots at the head of a former president protected by the Secret Service. And while many Americans learned of this terrible news in almost real time, this is exactly the kind of event where people say, where were you? How did you find out? And I bet you have your own story or recollection from this weekend. There was live TV coverage, social media posts, and an array of videos more than any other such historical event, given that everyone has phones on their cameras and people at political events are making videos anyway. But the first images and accounts were necessarily incomplete. We have now learned more in the ensuing two days. So here is a factual timeline of this tragic day. We can tell you at 6.03 p.m., Trump walked out on stage at this rally at the farm show grounds in Butler, Pennsylvania, just outside of that small town of about 13,000 people. With many in attendance, you could see cheering there as he took the stage, what would appear to be like any other of the many rallies that candidates hold. Trump began speaking Within about two minutes of walking out on stage, he spoke at 6.05 p.m. Hello, Butler, and hello to Pennsylvania. I'm thrilled to be back in this beautiful commonwealth with thousands of proud, hardworking American patriots. And that looked like a typical start of an event right up near the stage. But we now know farther back, there were already visible signs of a threat, possibly deadly. The shooter was seen crawling up a building roof near where Trump had begun to speak. Indeed, the individual was so visible and took long enough that a witness outside the rally perimeter, the security bubble that they make, says that he tried to warn police in advance. Here is part of that account from a BBC interview moments after the shooting. We noticed the guy crawling arm, you know, bear crawling up the roof of the building beside us, 50, 50 feet away from us. So we're standing there, you know, we're pointing, we're pointing at the guy crawling up the roof. And he had a gun, right? He had a rifle. A rifle. We could clearly see him with a rifle. We're pointing at him. The police are down there running around on the ground. We're like, hey man, there's a guy on the roof with a rifle. And the police are like, huh, what? You know, like, like they didn't know what was going on. 
There's a guy on the roof with a rifle, the witness says he told them. And this was around the start of Trump's speech that I showed you at, roughly five minutes after Trump began at 6.10 p.m. We now know one officer actually got up near this shooter, and this is before any shots were fired at the rally stage. The officer climbing up to the roof and apparently found the shooter who then pointed his rifle back at that officer, the AP reports. And with the shooter basically above how that officer had climbed up, that officer then retreated back down the ladder that they were using, which basically left a moment for the gunman to quickly fire at Trump. So that interaction we now know was the apparent impetus for the shooter's timing, then firing at Trump's head from the roof and drawing the swift shooting reaction from Secret Service snipers. A New York Times photographer capturing this remarkable and harrowing image of a bullet flying through the air. This is as Trump was speaking, and you can see from the visual, this was before the other shot, and he ducked down. Then after Trump's ear was grazed, he was seen bleeding, the Secret Service rushing him off the stage, and Trump raising a sort of defiant fist in the air. We also now have what we didn't in the immediate moments, which is aerial views, where you can see how the shooter was located in reference to Trump, who is a Secret Service protectee on the stage. You can see how close it is, 130 yards is close if you are an experienced marks person or shooter. We have an image from the New York Times that shows you can see exactly where the Secret Service snipers were placed to shoot back at this kind of thing. Homeland Security says the assassination attempt is clearly a security failure. And that rooftop where this gunman was posted up was already identified as a security vulnerability prior to the rally. So as we take this all in together as a nation, like other events, especially high profile ones that have the tinge of politics or opinion on them, we hear immediate reactions before we have all the evidence, or we have our memory, a kind of fog of war of how you first watched it or what you understood to have happened without any of the wider context. And we are still, from a standpoint of a federal investigation, at a very, very early stage. But with all of that known and big questions facing the Secret Service, our federal government about how this happened and whether something like this could happen again, we now are going to play the key part with that factual reporting and the knowledge that you have of how this occurred. If you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. Oh. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.